and, I mean, they talk and talk and talk, but they say nothing. All of that we will be, uh, we will be uh, responsible for. And uh, so the alternative to speaking sometimes is to keep your mouth shut, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and there are instances in Scripture that tells us when the, it's the best time to keep quiet. But there's also a couple times where we're supposed to speak out, you know, when it's easier to keep quiet, but maybe it's not. And, and you mentioned this morning about false teachers, and that's certainly a conversation we've had for a while, you know. So how do we, you know, approach that? But think about how important speech is in the Bible. You know, speech is important enough to God that he spoke the universe into existence. Jesus called Lazarus from the grave. I mean, he just said, Lazarus, come forth. Didn't do anything to lay his hands on him, just called him forth. He rebuked the storm. And the gospel is spread by the word of God, which is, you know, you know which doesn't imply that our actions don't, you know, spread the gospel too. You know, our, our speech and our actions go hand in hand. And we're told that Jesus is the word. So certainly, you know, there's an importance to the word in general, right? But are there times to keep quiet? And are there times we're required to speak out? Okay, um, quite a few verses, particularly in Proverbs when it comes to speech. But James 1.19 tells us we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Proverbs, uh, like, okay, a couple of verses to consider. Uh, Proverbs 10.19. In the multitude of words, there wanted not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Or like, uh, what was it, Mark Twain that said that, um, it's better to remain silent and to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Okay, Proverbs 15, 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. You know, the idea of you're, if you're wise, if you have some kind of wisdom, you know what you're saying is useful. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. That's kind of a Mark Twain thing. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Plato said it this way, wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. So sometimes it's better to keep quiet in order to learn. You can't, you can't learn if you're constantly talking, you know. I mean, think about it. If you're teaching a, a class and, you know, you have that student that's constantly talking and interrupting, you know nothing you're saying is going to sink in, Right? Okay, um, so there's a couple times when it's best to keep quiet, and sometimes it's best to speak out. Okay, uh, I want to I wanna touch on false teachings, though, because this week I've kind of used my time wisely by listening to uh, some what we consider hard preaching. You know, I knew I asked that before. It's like, who likes hard preaching? We have this idea of what it is. You know, so I was watching videos of independent fundamental Baptist preachers, and the names aren't important, but the amount of heresy I heard is staggering. I mean, there's a couple of times where they said, you know, uh, close your Bibles because, you know, you know, and just listen to me, you know. Certainly, the, the God, I, I was trying to debate whether I should share some of the things I've heard, whether how inflammatory they are. Like I said, the, the people on this, are, but, but we should be judged by what we say, okay. So, tell me how this, how this is wise to say or if this is, you know, shows the love of Christ. Okay, direct quotes, by the way. There are worse things than heifers and britches. I've had uh, heifers with long tongues have given me more trouble than heifers with britches. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of wisdom, a lot, a lot of uh, the love of Christ in something like this, right? Or there was an 11-minute sermon that I heard where literally the entire sermon was, I wear a white shirt because I'm called to preach. I wear a white shirt because I'm called to preach. Not a red shirt, not a blue shirt, definitely not a, a pink tie. I wear a white shirt because I'm called to preach. And gospel tracts in my Bible, and a big King James Bible. And as I was walking down this, this jail hallway, a man pressed his face against the glass and said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. What was the point of that sermon? Where was this going? Oh, here's another, here's another golden one. <laughs> it's like, they'll be selling Frosties in hell before I wear pink underwear. <laughs> what? This is, the, this is the hard preaching. And if you... If you understood some of the names attached to some of this, you'd be kind of shocked, okay? But this is not necessarily a condemnation of specific people and stuff, right? But that's independent fundamental Baptist preaching. 
thoroughly nothing about the gospel. You know, Paul himself said, giving no offense that the ministry be not blamed. And he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I heard none of that in, I mean, well, hours worth of this, this garbage is what it was, okay? And I got to think, you know, this is uh, typical, particularly of our denomination or what, you know, certainly the roots of it, right? Certainly not grounded in scripture. You know, most of it's either outright heresy or just personal opinion masquerading as biblical doctrine. Particularly when it comes to, like, the way you're supposed to look and dress, right? Which you won't find in scripture, by the way. Jesus always dealt with the heart, not with the outside. He even told us, uh, the Pharisees, you were white sepulchers, you know? Like, you look good on the outside, but the inside is what, is what the issue is. You're full of dead man's bones. So I got to thinking, okay, do we have a responsibility to speak out against false preaching? For any kind of false teaching. And, how, and if so, how do we do it? Um, would you think it's out, out of place if uh, a preacher came through here? You know, guest preachers, certainly a lot of evangelists kind of have this, this trademark about them because they, they can jump around so they don't really have time to be judged by what they say. But they'll come behind the pulpit and they'll say something that's at best questionable. You know, ask for amens. That's, that's another typical thing, by the way. But they say something, and would you think it odd if someone were to stand up in the congregation and basically ask for clarification? You know, it's like, hey, what did you mean by that? Or it's like, hey, that's not what scripture says. Would that feel out of place when someone's speaking from behind the pulpit? Because I'll say, yeah. We'd all look at it like, wait, you know, it's disrupting the service. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do something like this, right? Which would be a simple thing if you want clarification, right? Or if there's something false being said that you should, you know, just say, hey, that's not what the Bible says. Why would you say that kind of thing? So, you know, I don't see a provision for us for even questioning what goes on behind the pulpit. And you've said multiple times. I mean, you come up here three times a week most of the time, right? And, and you preach. And what I don't hear is people discussing what do you preach, whether it's scriptural, whether it's, you know, it's a heresy, or even something like, hey, I, you know, I understand this. You know, we just pretty much forget it when we go out the, outside the door, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Get us some thought. <laughs> but it's not it's not just you. We we do that because we've we've kind of deified anybody who's behind the pulpit anyway. You know, like this is this we've created, you know, this space right here is almost the entirety of our faith. We've kind of done that. We, instead, this should be, by the way. So you have, you know, people who are spoon fed from behind what's behind the pulpit. So even if we if that's our the way we operate, should we at least you know, double check to see if it's even true? Okay, so, um, okay, I, I want to go to Galatians chapter 2 because um, there, is, there are precedents for challenging heresy. And think about what, uh, at, at this time, particularly in the you know, time of Galatians, Peter was essentially the head of the Christian church at the time. You know, so much that the Catholics believed that he was the first pope. So it certainly had some importance. And, you know, Jesus said, I was, uh, you know, you'll be the rock of, you know, the rock of my, my church. But Paul wasn't impressed by that. Because think about what he says, okay? But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And this because, you know, he, he, you know Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles. So the Jews came to town and started, you know, questioning why he's doing that. So he cut ties with the Gentiles, which he was commanded to do, by the way. He was supposed to preach to the Gentiles and started, you know, hanging out with the, the Jews again and then having their doctrine basically, you know, pervade the, the gospel. Paul you know, had no problem standing to his face. Matter of fact, in, uh, wait. Okay, in 13, and other Jews assembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the man of Gentiles, and not as do with the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do with the Jews? He called him out in person, in front of everyone. Because I do believe there is... We do have a responsibility to do that. If there's a heresy being said from behind this pulpit, the, we should challenge it. How, okay, how do we know what to challenge? I know we bring up, uh, you know, Acts 17, 11 a lot, you know, with the Bereans. You know, Paul and, uh, Paul and Silas were sent to Berea to get out of Thessalonica, basically. And, it's, you know, in 17, 11 it says, you know, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with already in this mind, because you mentioned that this morning, right? and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. You know, it makes sense, right? But why would Luke even record that? Why would he even know that was what was going on? 
unless they found something that wasn't, you know, I'm led to believe that if they found something that wasn't lining up with Scripture, they didn't keep quiet about it. Why else, how else would Luke even, why would he even record this? How would he know that that's what they're doing unless they didn't keep quiet about it? And we already know how they did it because of this. If what's said behind the pulpit doesn't line up with this, you know, we have every right to challenge it. And, you know, you were working on Titus this morning, right? And there's quite a few verses when it comes to that, you know, sort of with, uh, okay, um, here's another thing. What, our responsibility, like I said, you can, you can, you can speak a heresy without even realizing, right? But a Christian cannot remain ignorant and call themselves a Christian. You know, we have, you know, entire congregations full of people that have never advanced from beyond the gospel. They've got the gospel, they're saved, and they never advance beyond that. Abundantly, like Christ said, they don't grow in the faith, they don't learn. So, of course, they're going to be swayed by what's being said behind the pulpit because that's what we made the entirety of our faith. Okay, uh, Titus uh, 2 8 says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. It kind of goes along with uh, Paul when he said, um, giving no offense that the ministry be not blamed. We know that, you know, televangelists that sell garbage on TV, you know, for money, basically, right, have damaged the faith. Because it's easy for an atheist to point towards that and say, look, this is what Christianity is. This is why I don't want any part of it or whatever, right? It's usually a cop-out excuse. But certainly there is um, some truth to that. We're responsible for, for the truth. And we have it. And, you know, we certainly made money off of it. Okay, uh, to one says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Okay, you can't claim something's a doctrine if it's not in here. Like I said, uh, you know, one entire sermon was about, you know, okay, here, uh, try not to share too much of the, the, the independent fundamental Baptist preaching I was listening to just because it's, it's inflammatory, you know, and it, it is ignorance, you know, and certainly not spoken in love. You know, most of it's mocking or, or hate filled, and it's usually just attacking somebody else or saying, look, look how much better we are. Certainly nothing about the gospel itself. And certainly scripture never seems to come into play unless it's a verse taken out of context. But I don't know what the solution to challenging, you know, false teaching is. You know, you don't want it to devolve into anarchy where you just kind of, you know, you have people jumping up all over the place saying, you know, you're a liar, you're wrong. You know, because it says we're supposed to be wise as serpents, but also gentle as doves. You know, we're supposed to be smart enough to know better, but we're also supposed to deal with situations diplomatically, you know. The whole purpose is to, you know, to correct the false teaching, but you don't want to lose a soul in the process. The whole pu- purpose is to correct somebody to bring them back into the fold. Unless somebody's just going to, you know, is, you know, completely hate-filled with what they're saying, and that has to be put a stop to. Because think about it. Someone, you know, you know, speaks a heresy from behind the pulpit. The ones of us that, you know, the, the ones that know better scripturally, you know, it kind of rolls off our backs. We can ignore it because we know better. You know, we know what scripture says. It's not going to bother us too much. We don't necessarily need somebody to come to the defense. But what about those that don't know better? What about those new Christians, you know? Isn't it our responsibility to shield them from heresies and false teachings? But how can we do that unless we know we don't know any better? That's just, you know, something to consider when it comes to, you know, times I, I feel like we are required to speak up. What this, particularly what this church sincerely lacks is a, dedicated Bible study, you know, outside of just what goes on behind the pulpit. It's not because, think about when you preach from behind the pulpit, you know, you've done the work. We haven't. So you can only share what you've uncovered, but how can we, you know, get as much out of it as you did if we didn't do the work ourselves? And it's, and certainly I'm, I'm sure people, you know, have their own Bible study, or you know, or, you know, either dedicated or every once in a while. But I don't see... Uh, congregational Bible study, whether it's small groups or, you know, certainly Sunday school kind of falls under that, but, you know, that's, it's almost like there's not enough time to really cover it enough, you know. Just, you know, just a thought there. Okay, uh, Galatians 6 kind of brings me to the next part about when we should say something, and consequently when we shouldn't, right? Galatians 6 says we should bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Because I mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago about, you know, you're not the only one who's required to counsel. I certainly don't want a single person to do, do marriage counseling. You don't, you know, like in uh, First Kings, you know, when you, you're supposed to seek, you know, Rehoboam, he was kind of seeking counsel for, from 
you know, Solomon's advisors, right? These older, wiser men. And he chose to ignore their counsel and listen to his peers instead, you know. So certainly the younger you are, the less, the less you should rely on the counsel and advice of your peers, by the way, you know. And one of the mistakes that, uh, that the younger generation makes is to ignore the wisdom of the older generation. Now, age doesn't necessarily imply wisdom, by the way, you know, because you could you, you could have been, you know, practicing ignorance for 40 years, and that means that there's no wisdom to back that up, you know. But certainly there's a lot that the younger generation can learn from the older generation. Consequently, um, you know, the older generation tends to look towards the younger generation as not, not having anything to add. So there's this kind of gulf between us, you know. So, you know, we don't have, you know, we don't have the right balance, I think, of going seeking counsel from older folks or, you know, older people even listening to younger folks, you know. We, and, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of broken people here, more than we'd care to admit. But because we've always been trained to, when we walk through those doors, to keep a, you know, to, you know wipe our faces, to, you know, keep things to ourselves. You know, someone asks, hey, how are you doing? What do we usually say? I'm oh, fine, doing okay, doing well, right? Instead of the truth is, hey, my life is falling apart. Hey, I don't know what, you know, I don't know where my faith is going. Hey, I'm, you know, things, I'm struggling, you know. Why do we do that? You know, is it because when we, you know, we're not expected to, you know, to bear each other's burden because we think that someone doesn't really care? You know, if someone asks, how are you doing? Or they're actually asking that, or is just, you know, small talk, a greeting, you know. It, next time you ask somebody, how are you doing? And then they start telling you the life story. Hey, my life's falling apart. Are you going to be uh, caught off guard? I mean, you asked the question, right? I don't, I don't know why we're not willing to go to each other and bear each other's burdens. It says, so, f- and so to fulfill the law of Christ. Think about that. I mean, it's a requirement. We're supposed to fellowship with each other, but we're all, this is, for lack of a better term, this is supposed to be a safe place amongst us, right? You're supposed to be able to spill your, your soul to somebody here and expect you know, and, and it's not just sins, it's just, you know, just troubles, worries, you know, questions. You know, we're supposed to be able to openly share this in the hopes that someone, will, you know, the, what the expectation is someone cares and that someone will, you know, kind of set us on the right path or at least, you know, grieve with those who grieve, you know. Once again, another thought because I think we've fallen way short of that, you know, requirement, you know, as a, as a body. Once again, I don't know what the solution to this would be, except that we're going to be more open with sharing, you know. And certainly, you know, you have, you know, p- individual people have friends here that they're more likely to go to. And certainly, you know, you don't want to you share too much, you know. Some things are meant to be personal. Some things are meant to be, you know, family only and stuff, right. But for the most part, we should be open enough to share, not, not just, you know, have a bunch of, you know, fake smiles plastered on our faces when our lives are secretly falling apart behind the door, closed doors, you know. Next part, um, and I got uh, another part of um, our, our speech, you know, I, I got to think about prayers, and not necessarily private prayers because I have no idea how those go, you know, and certainly there's a whole other wheelhouse right there, but certainly we can judge public prayers, and, you know, I've had multiple conversations with people, here, uh, whether it's, you know, ushers or, you know, you, or, you know, a couple of others, you know, certainly the ones that pray out loud a lot. And uh, we all kind of came to the same conclusion. You know, sometimes public prayers seem insincere. It's almost like you're trying to find the right words to pray to the room instead of the object of who we're supposed to be praying to to begin with, right? I mean, we know. Think about it. If, uh, you know, if somebody comes up, you know, to close in prayer or to even open in prayer and it goes more than 10 seconds, people start getting antsy. That doesn't say a lot for our relationship with God, does it? You know, I mean, who gets antsy after a 10-second conversation, you know? with the creator of the universe, by the way. And I got to thinking, um, you know, Francis Chan had a series on, on prayer. And one of the things he mentioned, you know, him being, he was, you know, Chinese-American, grew up in San Francisco, but he grew up in a Christian home. And he remembers before he ate, you know, any time they ate as a family, he always uh, repeated the same prayer in Cantonese, you know. I mean, he had it memorized, you know, word for word. And he couldn't eat until he said the prayer. He said he said it maybe 10,000 times before he actually, you know, before he went to school. Like told it, before he actually started school, right? And he remembers uh, one day he was, uh, well, more than once, but certainly he was aware of it at least once, uh, you know, because he couldn't eat until he said the prayer. But he was also too embarrassed to say it in front of his friends and stuff, right? So what he did is he dropped his fork on the ground, and as he was going to pick it up, he recited the prayer real quick. 
that doesn't say a lot for, you know, that being something real. That, that certainly sounds like something more ritualistic. And so he, uh, on his uh, series in prayer, he actually, you know, kind of, he, one of the things we have to do before we pray, particularly, you know, out loud and stuff, right? Take 30 seconds to imagine who you're actually praying to. Imagine yourself stepping in front of the throne of God, and your prayers will change. Like I said, a wise man comes to God without saying a word and stands in awe of him. Do we, do we, ha- do we feel that when we pray out loud? As a congregation, we're certainly it's supposed to be a body praying to the creative universe. Instead, it's just somebody trying to rehearse some words that, you know, while they're walking up the aisle, you know, to, to say it's a room that sounds, you know, poetic or, you know, fancy, whatever, you know, just something to say. That's why we, you know, we use vain repetitions. That's why, spe- you know, Jesus specifically says something about it. And uh, I think it was Clarence Sexton said that uh, it's not real until it's personal. Our prayers will come more real when we have a personal relationship, you know, with God. Recognize who he is. You know, as old Francis Chan also said that you can't exaggerate God. If he is everything that we say he is and believe he is, our prayers kind of, kind of want to change. You know, this thought, you, know, you have to put some thought behind it. That's kind of the whole, the, the whole key of, of speech is we have to put some thought into it. We can't be thoughtless. We can't be careless. And things, I, I believe, will change for the better if we, you know, speak with a purpose. Okay, so what is the purpose of speech? I have a few, you know, a few verses to get through here. And, you know, Ephesians 4.29 tells us that, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Our speech is supposed to edify. It's supposed to build people up, which means that you know, the opposite shouldn't be true. We shouldn't be tearing people down. I mean, you, you, you can edify, uh, you know, edify someone even if they've, you know, been overtaken in sin without condoning the sin, but without, you know, casting the person aside too, you know. Okay, Proverbs 15. Okay, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise use, uses, useth knowledge all right, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Okay, a soft answer is supposed to turn away wrath. We're not supposed to escalate things in arguments. The truth doesn't have to be shouted. You can speak the truth quietly, and it'll still have the same impact because it's still truth. The, and the tongue of the wise uses, uses, useth knowledge all right. Yeah, it's THs. <laughs> we're, supposed to, you know, we're supposed to use our knowledge and our wisdom for a purpose, too, you know. Not just saying things, hey, look at me, look how much I learned on Wikipedia or I Googled this, you know, kind of thing. It's just, you know, supposed to have a meaning. It's supposed to have a purpose to it. Okay, First Thessalonians, check it if you need it there. A couple of other purposes of our speech. Okay, uh, we're supposed to rejoice. It says rejoice evermore. Do we rejoice with the things we say? And rejoice in what, you know? That includes, you know, praise, worship. You know, is there joy to the things we say, or do we spend all of our time complaining? Okay. Pray without ceasing. If you were to walk down this hallway, you know, after the service is over, and see, you know, two or three people gathered together praying in the hallway, would you find that odd? Well, because it's not done in, at the altar and stuff, right? Would we try to avoid it, or would we feel like, hey, we can join in on this prayer? Would that be odd? Because I would say that would be odd sight, you know? Because it's something that we don't see enough. But it says pray without ceasing. If there's a burden, we shouldn't schedule a prayer meeting two weeks from now. We should pray for it right then, right? I mean, it makes sense. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Our word should give thanks to who, you know, who's given us everything. It says in him we live and move and have our being. And it's not just because we get the things we want. It's because our entire existence is owed to God. I don't hear people thanking him. Instead, we tend to curse God or complain when things don't go our way. Something that we're never promised, by the way. It's never supposed to go our way in the first place. It's supposed to go his way. Titus 2.8, like I said, sound speech that cannot be condemned. You know, The whole purpose is we don't say things that hurt the ministry. Pretty simple, right? Certainly heresies do that, you know. Okay, okay. First Peter chapter 2. 
But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Where's that right? And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of good conversation in Christ. No one should be able to find fault in the things we say. Like I said, I've mentioned you know, a couple of things that I heard, just, you know, and even if they were out of context, you know, with those, you know, heifers wearing britches and, you know, selling frosties in hell and stuff, right? And this, this is ignorant garbage is what this is, okay? But this passes for preaching, by the way. It, it, you can't even take that out of context. You know, it doesn't matter what the, the sermon is about. There's, that's garbage. certainly doesn't help. And certainly the fact that I can find fault with it means that there's something wrong with it. It says sound speech that cannot be condemned. Matter of fact, to the point where someone tries to find fault with you, they feel the shame for even trying to find something that's not there. And, uh, and, and okay, he also mentions that, you know, giving, you know, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. When someone asks why we believe, how do we respond? Do we get flustered and try to find answers, you know, because, you know, because we're caught off guard, we didn't get a chance to study and stuff, right? Because if that's true, then we may not be, this may not be real to us. Or are we ready to actually explain why we believe? It says be always ready to give an answer. Once again, all of this can be solved simply by getting into here. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult, you know. We're lazy. That's part of it. We spend so much time getting spoon-fed from what's behind the pulpit without doing our own, you know. Paul even had to rec- uh, reprimand, you know, some of the churches, you know, in his letters by saying, like, you, you're supposed to be at meat now, but I'm still having forced to give you milk, you know. You know, as a child grows, they go from milk to something more substantial, right? But we're, we're an entire generation of Christians that are still at milk and get, and get spoon-fed milk from the behind the pulpit all the time, too, you know. Like, you don't have to, for, for an entire body of saved believers, right, or claim to be, you right? How many salvation messages do we need to hear? But we always feel, feel the need to reiterate what it means to be saved in Christ because we seem to forget every single day, you know? We have to be reminded week after week because for some reason we haven't advanced beyond that. And I want to kind of end with, with this because a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The right word at the right time certainly to the right person in the right situation, is likened to treasure. Do we treat it as such? Do we look for someone that's hurting, that's someone that has a burden, that's somebody that has an issue? Do we see it as an opportunity to minister, to exhort, to edify, to, you know, to help correct them, you know, or bring them right back? Or if, what do you say to someone that's, that's lost a loved one? You're going to give them advice? You're going to tell them how they should feel? I mean, even, even with the best intentions telling them that things will be okay, it kind of seems hollow, don't it? Are we ready to even just grieve with them or to share in their burden, sharing their sorrow? Sometimes that's enough. You know, sometimes even that's a, a, a treasure, you know? Look, the, the whole, like I said, the whole purpose of this, because I'm going into here, that's not going to be part four. Cer- certainly I can go to hearing if I wanted to, but that's something completely different. But we, we cannot be careless with our speech. Certainly everyone that's here now can't, can't claim ignorance because, you know, read the scripture. <laughs> you can't say, hey, I didn't know him, brother. Sorry. <laughs> no, ignorance is bliss, but not for this crowd. <laughs> so we have to be aware of what we say. We can't be careless. We have to, and certainly we have to learn. You know, a lot, of, a lot of scripture says that we should have words of wisdom to share with someone. Well, where do you get wisdom from? Simple. This is how, like I said, this is truth. This is how we challenge a false teaching. This is how we gain wisdom. This is our guidebook for our speech. All right, so I kind of want to end with that.